Now, Proverbs 29, 25, now says, The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be saved. I want to talk about that. Now, you know, fear, like anything else, has two sides to it. There's a healthy side to it, and there's a sick side to it. Like old Bob Jones used to say, every good thing and every bad thing in this world is a good thing twisted. A lot of truth in that. Lord put fear in you to keep you alive. I'm mean, you stop thinking about it. If you weren't afraid of anything, you wouldn't last very long. If you weren't afraid of a red light at a crossing, you wouldn't make many crossings. And if you weren't afraid of speed limit sign, the speed of cars, well, you'd be dead pretty soon. Christ says, fear him, is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. Fear is a good healthy motive. Over there in the Hebrews, he says, Noah moved with fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household. You sing, t'was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieve. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed. You do all that. And so fear is a good thing. Uh, it's fear that makes you keep on working to make a living and feed your family. You're afraid to go hungry or get sick or die. It's fear that makes the fellow duck his head when an 88 goes over his head. I mean, if you weren't afraid of some things, you wouldn't live long. And yet the Bible says, the fear of man bringeth a snare. The fear of man bringeth a snare. But whoso trusts in the Lord, he'll be safe. I want to talk to you about that text tonight. Now, do you, do you know that's one of the greatest things that has to do with the damnation of young people, the fear of man? You stop thinking about all the things you've tried because somebody said you're a sissy if you didn't try them. You stop thinking about all the things you've picked up and looked at because somebody said you weren't a man and you won't grow, weren't grown up unless you did. And you stop and think about all the things you do in order to belong to the crowd so you won't have to sit in the sidelines and be alone and bear the reproach. Some of you got in a mess of trouble worrying about people. And if you worried as much about your standing with God as you do with people, some of you wouldn't be in the mess you're in the night. All these folks say, well, you know, I'm, this hippie business is a revolt against the establishment, you know, we want to be safe in public opinion. No, you're just conforming. You're just conforming, these people. You're conforming to another bunch of standards over here. Uh, you stop thinking about the fellow who's been talked into drinking by some guy coming around and saying, well, you know, the, the malt in it will do you good. The malt's good for you, you know, the beer. They'll get some malt milk then if the malt's good for you. And they say, well, you know, you're not a man, you have this, you know. Well, then you better stay a boy. And they say, well, you're not a woman, you tried this, you know. Did you ever see one of these? And they pass around these little old uh, thin paper things or single space type written along these dirty stories around the shower room and locker room and things like that. And some of you kids think you're in a big secret. You're not in any big secret. We went through that when we were young. I've got an advantage over you. I've been young. You've got been old. That's right. And a lot of times young people think they're getting away with something and every generation ever across the face of this earth has come down the same way. They say, a little bit doesn't hurt. But what are you scared of? We know how to handle it. Well, they got modern inventions now. They got medicine that can take care of it. Yeah, I know, I know. We heard that when we were young. Same old business. It doesn't hurt. It's good for you, you know. These things will pick you up, you know. And it will hurt you. I mean, well, they don't get scared. It's mid-Victorian prudery. They, they have a way of saying it, you know. And a couple of years go by, and you finally get married. After a couple of years of married life, you go to the hospital one night. Your wife's up there and having a baby, and you're walking up and down that floor waiting for that baby to show up, and first thing when you look through that little old grass bin and they show you that baby, they pull back that blanket and they show you the toes and the hands. Now, what do they do that for? What do they do that for? Do you pray about those things? I mean, kid, you're going to miss an awful lot in high school and college. There isn't anybody in high school or college going to tell you why when you go by the glass window. They pull back the blanket and show you the hands and the feet. And it isn't a textbook in high school or college. Don't even look for it. It isn't there. He says, what are you driving at? I'm driving at this, brother. There's some things in this life you do well to be afraid of. And I'll tell you, in those days come to some of you fellows that you're going to go and live like the devil, not paying attention to me or any other preacher. You're going to be walking up and down there, boy, and the sweat is going to come out in your forehead and on your face. And you're going to wonder and wonder and wonder. You say you don't have any conscience, you'll have one then. You'll have one then. Lord puts that little bundle of life in your arms. Your conscience will come up. A friend of mine, Bill Mayer, talked about a couple fooling around with pills and stuff and LSD and this and that. That baby finally came, that 
baby came there with one ear on one side of its face and an eye on the other side of its face and hair all over where the front of the face should have been. The mother screaming off to a mental ward. Somebody said, well, it doesn't happen a lot. Yeah, it might happen to you. It happened to them. I tell you, a good healthy fear of some of those things is healthy. You know that? Somebody said, well, try this. Try that. I know when to quit. I know when to quit. My church members kid me about coming up here and playing water for us. So you're getting too old for that. You're getting too old for that. Well, yeah, maybe. Maybe. <laughs> but I tell you, I know what I am too old for. I'm too old to go around messing around with skis in the back end of a motorboat. They don't get me out there. And some of my young men down where I come from, we go out, you know, swim in these creeks, you know, and ponds and rivers and things sometimes. They get diving off these railroad bridges, you know, 30 feet high. Well, I'll go up 20, 22 feet with them. When they get up to 25 feet, I won't go up with them. And they say, oh, make sure you're checking. I say, that's me. I'm checking, man. I'm checking. I'm checking out. There comes a time when a good healthy fear is good. A man one time in the Navy in one of those uh, bottles over there in the coral sea or midway somewhere, a man in the Navy one time was receiving instructions from a superior officer, and he said, I'm scared, I'm scared. And the officer said, well, that's all right, that's normal. He said, it's a good healthy sign when a man is scared before going to combat. And he said, well, if that's the truth, you're looking at the healthiest man in the whole U.S. Navy. A <laughs> lot, lot, lot of truth in that. Uh, they get you in, they can't get you out. I mean, he says, well, a little bit doesn't hurt. Let's go a little further. We know when to quit. Everybody else does it. Pretty soon got illegitimate children, BD, and everything else. The thing is, you're afraid to resist. See? You're afraid to say no. The fear of man bringeth a snare. But whoso puts his trust in the Lord, happy is he. A good, healthy fear is a good thing. In the Navy one time, they had a young fellow up there on the diving board, 40 feet in the air. They were teaching these young men how to dive off the diving board like they're going off the, the, the uh, deck of a sinking ship. And they told this kid up there, they said, jump, jump. And he stood up there, his knees knocking together, and the sweat running down his face. And he said, I can't, I can't. And the officer in charge said, just pretend that you're on the deck of a sinking ship. What would you do? And he said, I'll wait for it to sink 20 feet lower. <laughs> or a jump, you know, <laughs> which, is good, which is good common sense. The trouble is, you know, they get you in trouble and they can't get you out. That's the trouble. I once upon a time, this happened in Philadelphia, there was a recruiting poster for the U.S. Navy, and it had a picture there, you know, of a young man all dressed up and traveling in foreign ports, you know, and sitting around with a foreign girl, you know, I mean, real hardship. And he was, you know, on a boat behind him and all that, and the sign said, what do you want, young man? And across that thing, somebody had taken a black felt pen and put, I want out! <laughs> Some guy got in there one one was cracked up to be. See? And that's what they'll do with you. They'll get you in further and further and further and further, and pretty soon you want out and you won't be able to get out. All right, now I'm going to say some things about the fear of man. First of all, the fear of man can get you to deny the Lord. That was Simon Peter's trouble. Simon Peter got out there and with that bunch and he... He got afraid to confess Christ. It wasn't that he was yellow in the physical sense. He was yellow in the moral sense. You know, there are two kinds of courage. There's physical courage and there's moral courage. And a young man in this country would have enough guts to get in a pair of skates and try to body check, uh, uh, body check uh, Bobby Hall, one of those fellows, but they don't have enough guts to come up on the platform and tell people to love Jesus Christ. The two kinds of nerves, see. It takes one kind of nerve, you know, to get out there and mix it up with them in a ball field. And it takes another kind of nerve to get a tract and give it to your biology teacher. See? So the fear of man can get a person to deny the Lord. Simon Peter's trouble was he knew if he confessed Christ that uh, he'd have to fight, and the Lord wouldn't let him fight with a sword. So he knew if he had to fight, he couldn't fight with a sword. And he knew they'd take him and beat him up. And he heard his Lord in there getting beat up like a lamb led to the slaughter. And Simon Peter wouldn't look back at anybody to beat him up. You know, Alexander Hamilton wrote in his diary right before his fatal duel with Alan Burr. Alexander Hamilton wrote in his diary, I know what I'm doing is wrong, but I'm afraid not to do it. And as many young fellows, he told the truth, he'd say, I know what I'm doing is wrong, but I'm afraid not to do it. I said they get playing chicken, you know, driving cars toward the edge of a cliff and then open the door and try to jump out before it goes over. No that business. 
When I was a boy, we used to put the left uh, wheel of the, of the car on the, on the line. And back in those days, they had running boards and fenders in those cars. And we'd go down that thing 60 miles an hour at each other. And the idea was the first guy that pulled his wheel off the line was chicken, you know. Big sport. <laughs> we get out there between Leavenworth and Topeka, Kansas, put those cars in that line, go down there. And back in those days, when they said a guy was traveling fast, they'd, get, they'd say, travel like 60. Back in those days, 60 was fast. I mean, the world record speed car was about 140 miles an hour. Bonnie Oldfield and his golden submarine. We get out there and go down that thing with that left wheel, that line, and we come at each other, like that, and then the strip it about that far. And I'll tell you, many times I've heard those running boards ring going by there. I mean, this hit just like that going by there. Then we stop and get out and say, you turned off. I did not. You did too. You did first. Didn't either. Did too. Get back and try it again. Boom, down there, you know. Now, you know, guys do that's crazy. You know that? I say, hell, oh, some of you, some of you fool with it, haven't you? Yes, you have. Don't you look at me that way, you rascal. <laughs> you have. You have. You know, back in my day, when a boy got to be about 16, if he was drinking and smoking, he's considered a real, real devil, boy. At 16 or 17, they go early these days. I bet you there's some kid in here, this meeting here tonight, uh, around 14 years old, has only tried pot. Or marijuana. Bet you have. They move fast these days. They can get you to deny the Lord. That's it. Uh, people get scared and are afraid to confess Christ. You take, uh, you take the Herod. Herod got afraid about his vow and made to a dancing girl. And because the people that were there at the table, he was afraid of what they'd think if he broke his vow. He told that bird he didn't have anything, even the half of the kingdom. And he was so afraid to lose face in front of that crowd that he had the Baptist preacher's head cut off. That cost Herod his soul. His soul. Herod was afraid of everything except what he ought to have been afraid of. And you know something? A real education should be to show you what to be afraid of, what not to be afraid of. Modern American education, when a fellow comes out, he really doesn't know much anything. They teach him just not to be afraid of anything. I think it was FDR, that old communist, that said, he said, you know, I hate war. Eleanor hates war. Fowler hates war. That's the dog, Fowler. And he said... He said, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. He's a liar. There's a lot more in this life you better be afraid of than just being afraid. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. How about cancer? How about diabetes? How about imprisonment? How about bankruptcy? How about going to hell? The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Folks are prone to or some fool making a stupid speech like that. You take, you take Herod, Herod was afraid of everything in this world except what he had to fear. The Bible said he was afraid of John the Baptist to hurt him day by day. The Bible said he feared the people because of John the Baptist. The Bible said he feared the people he sat at dinner with. Why, he feared everything except what he ought to have been afraid of. One time a little boy said to his daddy, he said, Daddy, he said, are you afraid of half a lunch? And his daddy said, no, I'm not afraid of half a lunch. The boy said, are you afraid of booger bears? He said, no, I'm not afraid of booger bears. He said, well, Daddy, are you afraid of big old lions? He said, no, I'm not afraid of lions. Little boy said, Daddy, he said, aren't you afraid of anything but mama? <laughs> <laughs> like a lady said to her husband at a family spot one time, she said, stop standing there making fists at me in your pockets. <laughs> The fear of, the, of, of man can get you to deny the Lord, like Simon Peter. The fear of man can get you to make uh, guilty compromises. Well, that's what got America and all the trouble it's been getting into and always will get into. Folks, you know, you, you begin a, if you want to give, give a dirty word in politics, all you've got to say is isolation. And you say isolation, I guess that's about the dirtiest word you could use. And we have a funny idea in these days that you've got to get involved. Get committed. Get involved. Get involved. Get involved. Get involved. Well, I'll tell you, we've been involved so much now, they just about got us. And back then, in World War II, we got involved with a nation that professed to be atheists, and we knew they professed to be atheists. There wasn't any doubt about it. Nobody was kidding anybody. Nobody was fooling everybody, anybody. And we were afraid of one country the size of Oregon. So we signed up with the Russians, sent them about $3 billion in lend-lease tanks and stuff, 
had won the war with them, now we got them on our hands again. You know what the trouble was? The fear of man. That's the trouble. On your coin it says, in God we trust. The Bible says on there somewhere, it says, in God we trust. Americans don't trust that coin as far as they can throw it. With God we trust on it. They just trust the coin. They don't trust God. The fear of man can make, have you make purely compromises. Compromise we made back in World War II have cost us ever since, and they're going to keep on costing us till the Lord comes back. And you as a Christian can compromise with the world, and compromise with the devil, and compromise your testimony where it isn't worth anything, and compromise with the flesh if you fear man. The fear of man, the Bible says, bringeth the snare, but whoso trusts in the Lord, happy is he. If you want to see a perfect example of what a compromise is, you listen to the politicians. They'll show you how to do it. Doubt that Democratic Convention in Miami. I mean, for a while, you know, it looked like they moved Disneyland down there to me. <laughs> and down there, you know, they, and, and I always thought Eagleton fit real good. I don't know whether you folks are Democrats or Republicans or Christians, but you take all, I thought, I thought Eagleton, I thought it fit real good, you know. I mean, you had all the hippies, yippies, zippies. Why don't I have a couple of coops there, you know, and round the thing out, you know. Have a guy get up there and say, our, our foreign policy, I believe, in Taiwan and Formosa should be to protect the inside our... <laughs> no. Big deal. Did you ever hear those politicians? One of them said, in regards to this new squirrel law, they passed some squirrel law down in Florida, he said, half of my friends are for it and half of my friends are against it, and I wish to say that I stand with my friends. <laughs> I try to do it. I try to do it. You know what one of those old-time Democrats said down there at Miami? He said, our party used to stand for blood, blood, sweat, and tears, and now it stands for dope, sex, and queers. <laughs> well, he said, yeah, man, yeah. And he wasn't even about the speaker. <laughs> you know, there's many young ladies compromise on these lines. The older sister got married and the competition got too stiff. You figured you had to be one of the party, you know, and get you on too, that kind of thing. Sold out job. Some of you compromise. That's what folks talk about what's wrong with this modern dress and wire. That's all what's wrong with it. Young lady, you just compromise. You want attention, so you'll sell out to get it. That's all it is. You want somebody to look at you, so you'll dress like anything or nothing to get somebody to look at you. You're easy to figure out. Folks say, well, I just see what I want to do, but I just think you're a liar. You're just stuck on yourself. That's your problem. And you just want somebody to look at you so you do anything to get their attention. That's all it is. It's compromise. It's all it ever has been or ever will be. A young lady said to me down in Pensacola one time, she's for a brother Ruffman. She said, this boy's asked me to marry him. And I said, well, is he a, a Christian? She said, yes. I said, does he love you? She said, yes. And I said, well, are you planning to get married? She said, well, do you think it's right to marry somebody you don't love? And I said, no. And she said, well, I don't love him, she said. Well, I said, I wouldn't marry him. And she said, well, what do I tell him? And she said, well, you, I said, you better tell him now. And she said, if I tell him now, it'll tear him up and break his heart. He said, he really loves me. And I said, well, all right, then get married and tell him later. <laughs> right. And she said, well, oh, that'd be worse than if I told him now. Nothing so about her. And I said, okay, you better tell him now. And she did. And she did. But you know, there's some that don't. You know what the trouble is? The fear of man. You don't want to go it alone. You don't want to be an old maid. Some of you girls think if you're not married by the time you're 18, there's something wrong with you. Why, if some of you got married before you were 21 and showed something was wrong with you, I'd not rather have uh, an old maid in my family than the son of law some people got. The fear of man bringeth a snare can call a guilty compromise with the world system. That isn't all. The fear of man can cause silence and inactivity on the part of the Christian. We have a certain kind of a safe Christianity today that goes on where God's people get kind of institutionalized and they don't speak up. Their testimony is a collective testimony and they don't have a personal testimony, a personal witness. Now, I believe in collective testimony. I believe a church or a school ought to have a testimony that's known. But I'll tell you something. If you're a child of God, you ought to have one that's known. The people in your town know you're a Christian? 
Do they know that you go to a fanatic old time Bible believing Baptist church? Do they know you're a separatist and a nut and a coot? Well, why don't they know it? What's wrong with your testimony? I uh, fear a man get that Christian to shut his mouth. And God knows how many times God's people have shut their mouths when they should open their mouths because they're afraid what man might think or man might say or man might do. You know what Christian morale is? Christian morale is knowing where you're going, knowing how to get there, knowing God's going to get there, and just saying to the world, I don't care what you say, how you feel about it, this is how it is. And then sticking with it and staying on it. Morale, morale. A fellow man said, he said, morale is making your legs do something that your head knows is impossible. A general said one time to his own legs in a barrel when they were shaking and his knees were knocking, he said, if you knew where I was taking you, you'd shake worse than that. And then took them on in, brother. And you know all God's people like, ought to be like that? The Bible says the righteous are as bold as a lion, but the wicked flee when no man pursue it. You ought to be bold in your testimony. You know, that's why we don't have a lot of people out in visitation. That's why a lot of Christians never go in visitation. They have all kinds of alibis. Oh, I can't talk. Oh, I can't think. So reality is dropped in, you know. Or something like that. Well, this night's my favorite TV. It isn't. You know what the trouble is? There's just a, there's just a stripe up that back. That's the problem. Sure, that's it. Now, I'll confess to you, I've been scared out knocking on doors. I don't enjoy it all the time. It gets good when you get doing it. By the time you knocked on ten doors, you get in the swing of the thing, and then, you, then they can't stop you. But what are those first two? Did you ever go up to every Christian ought to do this? Now, if you haven't done this, do it. Uh, in your hometown where you live, go to the rich section and find the biggest, richest house in that section. I mean, get one of those $155,000 job man with three car ports and a, and a big old 22-foot boat there and a trailer in the yard and a couple of big German shepherds. Get you one of those. And just walk right up that door and, and you know, don't give it this, you know. You know, you knock on that door and say, hope we're not at home. <laughs> you get the track out and get ready to leave it there, you know, hoping they don't hear you. I mean, bang on that thing, man. And then they come to the door and say, good evening. Say, I'm so and so from such and such a church. I mean, just put your colors in the mask and raise them. And so I'm showing those up church, and I just came by tonight to talk to you to give him that invitation to come out to church, and I was wondering if you had been saved and hold out that track. Now, if you haven't done that, you ought to do it. And I'll tell you something. If you don't get any results, it'll do you more good than the person you visit. It'll give you some morale, give you some backbone. The fear of man bringeth a snare and get the Christian silent and active. Now, like I told you before, to get down there in uh, Pensacola, and I'll tell you, I got some young men down there, like I said, that, that make me look like a liberal. And I think sometimes, I'm sure, uh, sometimes some of them have a little bit too much guts. I mean, it gets kind of fresh, you know, after a while, and a lot of people blame that stuff on me, and I don't, I don't encourage them, but I may kind of inspire them or something. <laughs> but anyway, I have young men down there that have, you know, I'm just wild stuff, you know, like a bunch of one time went into a Catholic Church and turn the statues upside down. But I don't, I don't, so I don't, I don't agree with that, see. I don't, uh, I don't uh, encourage that, you see. And when I'm going on that board out the candles, you know, and bust the heart, the poor sister's coming in. <laughs> well, you know, Paul says, Paul says, we, we have knowledge, we know an idol is not anything, you see. But to some people it is, you know. Some people mean something. I used to have a little Christopher statue, and I hung it on my, my rearview mirror by the neck. I had it hanging by the neck. <laughs> and when I'd pull it to a stop, I'd take that thing and flip it from the finger, you know, and it'd go boing! <laughs> and I'd say, boy, if looks could kill, I've been dead 15 times a day. And some of those students said, I'll tell you what, let's do this. Let's get a rubber statue of Mary and tie it onto a bumper. I said, no, no, not that. No, we can't go that far. That's too far. That's too far. But we got some wild ones. One of our young men went down to a juke joint in that town, bad place. Came in there on the earth, shooting pool, banging away, and he came in there and walked up the biggest, roughest looking cat you could find in the whole joint. And he walked right up to him and he said, uh, I want to ask you a question. The guy said, What is it? And this kid of ours said, Do you think Christians are tough? 
<laughs> and this guy said, black or black? No. And this kid said, well, I'm a Christian. He said, I'll tell you what. He said, if you dare do something that I tell you to do, I'll show you how tough I am. And the big guy said, it's a deal. And he said, okay, if you've got enough nerve to go over there and pull that switch out of that jukebox in the wall, that plug, without asking the owner, i got enough nerve to get in this table and preach. And this big fella goes over and yanks it out, you know. That's why I get that. This guy gets up on the table and preaches. At about the time he starts, everybody just petrified, you know. All except one little old tough guy just looked at him, went on back to shooting pool, and he just got queued up, and this big fellow reaches over and takes the white ball and puts it behind his back and just stands there like that. He preached to him 15 minutes. Science and inactivity can come from the fear of man. All that is and all. The fear of man can hinder, can hinder your race. Paul said about a certain bunch of people, he said, you did run well. You did run well. Who hindered you? But you shall not, should not obey the truth. God's people get saved and they start out in the road and start doing what the Lord wants them to do and have victory. Then they slow down. Some of you kids thrown down since last year. Some of you left here last year. You were right. You were filled with the Spirit. You go to do something for God. You're on fire for God. You got back at that school. You did pretty well for a while. And then one thing led to another, and one thing led to another. And the first thing you know, your testimony went all to pieces. You got back in the old slumps. You got down the mouth again. You said, well, boy, if I go to camp this year, I'm not going down the aisle again. You know, it doesn't do any good. Well, the old book says you did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? You get going to race for God and try to do something for God, and something hinders you. What is it? Well, I'll tell you what it is nine times out of ten, brother. It's the fear of man. It's the fear of man. The fear of man hinders the race for God. Gets you afraid to go on ahead. While a young fellow gets called to preach, he gets all kinds of wild offers. He gets all kinds of wild threats. Why, there are people when you get called to preach and imply that if you don't go to one of these big old denominational schools and get in good with the convention or the presbytery, of the association that you're out to preach in a brush harbor. And the devil tell you, well, if God's called you to mission field, he'll say, well, you can't go to the mission field. How in the world are you going to go to the mission field? Well, you get over there, you won't have any money, you have to eat like they do and raise all that money to go, all that money for passage and passport and trucks and all this business. Well, you can't go, and he'll scare you out. The fear of man hinders the race. All right, now from a positive standpoint. I want to say this. The text says not only the fear of man bringeth a snare, the text also says, but whosoever trusteth in the Lord shall be saved. Do you know what the center verse in the Bible is? A 31,000 plus verses in the King James Bible. Do you know what the center verse is? Folks say, well, those verse numbers weren't inspired. Well, maybe they weren't, but they sure got preserved mighty good. Do you know what the center verse in the King James Bible says? It says it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. Now, how do you count it coming out like that? Well, let me ask you this. How do you count for the fact the center of that verse is the Lord? The center of an authorized version is the Lord. Count the words in that verse, the 14 of them. You can't get one and equal on both sides. You've got to get two words for the middle, and the two words are the Lord. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. You say, well, the other Bibles have that too. No, they don't. But the other Bibles add verses that are not there and take out verses that are there. Some what about the original. It isn't in the original. The original does the Bible look like that. You better go for the one you got. The one that says, it is better to trust in the Lord than put confidence in men. Now, I'm going to talk about the positive part. Who shall trust in the Lord? Safe is he. He's safe. This is supposed to be an angel, see. You have to put wings on them the folks don't know what they are. Now, in the Bible, no angel has wings. But you have to put wings on the folks don't know what they are. And this thing, the Lord, is signed by this fellow and tell him what to do. He says, all you've got to do is just take this fellow on. <laughs> Here, you can get where you're going. <laughs> and my text says, the fear of man, the fear of man bringeth a snare. I mean, let's just face it. Has it looked like that to you sometimes? I mean, looking at the obstacles that surround you and stood in your path, uh, in living for God, or doing what God wanted you. Have you looked about like that? Well, whoso trusts in the Lord shall be saved. Saved from what? 
safe from yielding to temptation. There are no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. Old Martin Luther used to say, jokingly and a wise saying, he said, my temptations have been my masters of divinity. <laughs> Talking about his training. Somebody said to Edison one time, he said, Edison, aren't you ever tempted? He said, no, I'm too busy. I wore that so enough, but he only slept four hours a night. Maybe that's one of the reasons why some of you have as many temptations you do, you're not busy enough to avoid them. Satan yielding to temptation. Years ago, I was an evangelist. I was a full-time evangelist about 12 years. And I was out in that road in all kinds of situations with a very bad situation at home and on the field. And I went out in hotels and motels in St. Louis and Cincinnati and Chicago and Washington and Memphis and New Orleans and God knows where. And I tell you, some of those nights got pretty rough, man. All those folks coming there and banging around those rooms, keep all the stuff going 12 o'clock at night, 1 o'clock in the morning. I went to St. Louis one time to hear the word they said right through the wall. I mean, just right out of Mickey Spillaney, boy, anything you wanted. James Baldwin and the rest of them. After that thing got going, I phoned downstairs, put in a complaint. Somebody came upstairs, told those people to have to quiet down. They left and got out. Things quieted down. I went on to sleep. When I got to sleep, about 3 o'clock in the morning, they came back out of the room and started again. And I got me some tracks and shoved them under the door in two adjoining rooms. That place got so quiet over there. You know, the next morning when I got up and walked out to my door, there were some whiskey bottles in front of my door. <laughs> Which is fair enough. I mean, if you give your testimony, they've got a right to give you theirs. Amen? <laughs> oh, no, 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 I don't care. I don't care. All right, the, the, the question in the Lord will keep you safe from harm of every kind. Harm of every kind. One time the plane was in some terrible turbulence, and the pastors were all scared to death. And somebody there talked to a former airline pilot in that plane and said, this is something wrong, but the stewardess keeps telling us it's all right, but this is something wrong. The tail weaving and back and forth and... That other airline pilot went up there and walked up in the cockpit in the front cabin and talked to a while and came back, sat down beside his distraught uh, companion sitting beside him, and he said, it's all right. He said, I've been up there to see the pilot. He said, I, I saw his face. It's all right. Just went to look at his face. He was going to get him through. And I tell you, when it gets rough and it gets tough, kids, you want to take a look at the pilot's face. When the old ship like it looked like it was about ready to crash, you hear the lightning and see the... Lightning and hear the thunder and soon the breakers dashing, trying to break down your soul. Go off and look at who's running the ship. They get you through. That Bible said, He that has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. That Bible says, Faithful is he that calls you who also will do it. Paul said, God is able to lift me out of every evil, from every evil work, and preserve me to his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever, all kind of harm. Time of unemployment. My God shall supply your need to the riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Harm in battle. A thousand fall by your right and ten thousand by your left. It'll not come nigh thee. Back then, World War II, <coughs> an old medic, a private named Atwell, went to the first aid station, coming to the Sea Creek line, and one night those 88s got the range of that first aid station, and all those boys out there in the line waiting to get in and get first aid and second aid, got wounded again. And those 88 sit that place, and right when that doctor was operating on patients, they were blown all to pieces, and the tubes and bottles and blood and everything flying every which way. Fellows up there in the standing in the corridors of that hospital screaming, Mother, 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 Mother. I saw they yell when things go wrong. I tell you, don't you let them kid you a bit, brother. It isn't like you see it in the movies. When those fellows, some of those old big, tough, cussing, dirty, Godless rascals, when those artillery bombardments start coming in, if they got a stomach wound, begin to scream, they don't have any God to call on. And they're out there saying, Mother! 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 I mean, 22, 23, and 24 years old. And that plaster was falling dust on that place, and these idiots of falling explosions, breaking in glass and throwing stones and dropping men around that room like potato sacks. And that well said he rolled under a table there and began to give himself the last rights of contrition. He thought he was going to go, and about that time he turned over and he saw one wounded guy lying there covered with plaster and dirt, lying there in a stretcher, couldn't move, and his face was straight up in the air, but the top of his lungs, that old boy was singing, Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as... <laughs> that stuff coming in there. That fellow was safe, man. Safe. Marching as to war with the cross of Jesus going on before. 
Whoso puts his trust in the Lord shall be safe. One time they said to a lady in a certain plant, they said, you better quit witnessing or you'll get fired. She said, well, I'm a Christian. I'm going to witness my Lord. And she did. Finally, the manager called her in and said, I've been getting complaints about your witnessing. She said, well, I'm sorry. She said, I've tried to be tactful about it. And I haven't taken up any time. And I haven't done it on the job just in off hours. And he said, well, don't you know you're liable to get fired? And she said, please, sir, I wish you wouldn't. She said, I've got two children, no other kind of work, two children to take care of, no husband. And he said, well, he said, are you going to keep on witnessing? She said, I'm sorry, we're opportunity to afford this stuff. I'm going to have to. He said, good. He said, that's the kind of people we want. Give you a raise. <laughs> Gave a raise and kept her. I mean, what the they're going to do, see? The Bible says, the fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord, he shall be safe. You don't know how it's going to go. I got a bunch of ladies down there at my church. I guess, I guess some ladies just wild some of the men. A couple of those ladies, I mean, grown mothers with families, out there driving down the road, and they couldn't find three or four houses they were supposed to stop at, and couldn't find the addresses. So they stopped a construction gang, stopped by a construction crew working on the road, and they got out and began to pass out tracts and witness. One of them was standing there with the New Testament, telling them how to get saved, and the boss that job drove along, came up there in a little two and a half ton trucks. And he pulled on God that thing and says, what's going on here? And one of my ladies says, well, we're telling these men how to get saved. And he said, well, good, they need it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was preaching, I was preaching the street about four or five weeks ago in downtown Pensacola and got preaching down there. You know, people going by act like they're not listening, but you'd be surprised how much they pick up. And there was a scaffold up there, one of those buildings, a bunch of potatoes on it. And when I got through preaching, I went over there and stood under that thing, listened to them talk, while some of the other boys preached. That's one of the big kicks I get out of life, just going around that street, just listening to what people are saying, what those boys are preaching. It's a circus. It's a circus. I got around that scaffold, and I heard those guys talking. And they were talking about this and that, and they laughed. And one of them said, Ah, oh, crap, crap, that, not that screwball talking about hell. Who does he think he is, man? Who is he talking about hell, anyway? And the boss man down at the bottom of the scaffold was smoking a cigarette and... <laughs> Looking up at him, you know, looking back across the street, looking up at him. That guy up in the scaffold kept going and said, No, he said, Ain't no hell, ain't no hell. And this old boss man out at the bottom put up that cigarette and said, Well, I'll tell you one thing. He said, You be careful up there where you're working. If your foot slips, you're going to find out. <laughs> and he wasn't even saved. Neither of them were saved, you see. Uh, you just don't know. The thing is, is witness, 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 witness. God will use it. The fear of man bring up the snare. And this then and who trusts the Lord to be safe, safe for time, safe for eternity. If you've been saved and born again, you never have to worry about going to hell. You may have to worry about a Christian testimony. You may have to worry about living a good life. You may have to worry about making a living. You may have to worry about the army or dying young or getting married wrong or going to the wrong school or having the wrong profession. There may be a lot of things you have to worry about, but going to hell isn't one of them. The time comes for you to die, you can face it just like Jesus Christ faced it, or Paul, or the greatest saints that ever lived. Admiral Halsey, Bo Halsey, in World War II, came on his first <coughs> uh, charge one time, his first battle wagon to take command of a fleet. And when he came on there out in the South Seas, some shells started flying around, anti aircraft and stuff. And Halsey hit the deck, coming up on this battle wagon, and a man there laughed at him, a chief petty officer. And how's he got up and promoted the fellow? Right on the spot. That's the kind of man you need. The kind of can laugh at death. And I tell you, you can't laugh at sin. You can't laugh at sin. But you can laugh at death. You got it made if you're saved. You're safe eternally. You realize that? I wish you'd get a hold of that. You got a hold of something that won't break. One time a little old boy survived a shipwreck by standing on a rock. And the rock was off the surf. And the winds Pounded and waves roared all night long. They tried to get a boat out there to reach them and couldn't do it. The next day when everything had calmed down and got quiet, they got a boat out there to get him. That poor little shivering wretch came off that rock just soaking wet from head to foot, shaking from head to foot. And they said to him, boy, he said, were you scared out in that rock all night long? He said, I trembled and shook all night long. He said, but the, but the rock didn't. The rock didn't. And I'm on the rock. Hallelujah, brother. I believe in rock and roll. I'm on the rock, and I'm on the roll. <laughs> and the roll is called up, Your Honor, I'm on the rock. You're going to bother me, honey. Years ago, in 1889, they had a terrible flood up there in Johnstown. 
And that, uh, that flood was a notorious flood, one of the greatest disasters that ever hit America. And that terrible flood, people were swept away by the thousands. One poor mother who'd come up to Johnstown to live there had been up there about uh, 20 years. She came in from West Virginia. And that flood, she lost her husband and five children. And her husband was already gone when the flood finally hit the valley and washed them on down. And she was in a house there where the flood came up to the tabletop and then the stairs and then the second floor. And she took that little boo with her, her five children, and took them out there and got them through the, uh, the water up the stairs, the second floor, out the window on the roof. And the water came up to the roof. And on pieces like the roof and boards going by there, she'd take each child and put them on a plank or a board and kiss them goodbye and turn them over to God and turn them loose. Five of them, down with the baby. And then she turned loose. So she never found a one of them again. Somebody said to her, ask the flood, what was she going to do? She said, I don't know. She said, I think I'm losing my mind. She said, I'm going back to West Virginia. I've just got to do a lot of thinking. And a lot of families like that. It's strange how quick people forget things like that. The world moves on too fast. But those things happen. And when that flood came down that valley, the first thing anybody saw down that valley was a man on horseback. And that bird came down down that valley just as fast as that horse would go, screaming and hollering and saying, Get out of the valley, get to the hills, get to the hills, get to the hills. And people heard that fellow yell, said, Why, well, he's a fanatic, he's a nut, he's crazy. And some of them said, No, there's something wrong. And some of them began to hear this rumbling and rolling up the valley, and they headed for the hills. And that fellow went down that valley and crossed the bridge to get to the other side of the valley, and that Tidal wave of that flood came down, hit him on that bridge going across there, and that was the end of him. And that flood went on down that valley, washing out bridges, taking freight cars and bus cars and rolling them like uh, tin pins down that valley. And while that thing was going on, the port of it was getting around the country, and one man said to an engineer, he said, didn't you build a bridge over that valley? He said, yes. He said, has the flood got there yet? The man said, no. The other man said, when that flood gets there, it'll wash your bridge out, and that'll be the end of it. And this fellow laughed and said, not my bridge. And the fellow said, it's washed out all the other bridges, taking the freight cars off the railroad tracks with it. He said, it won't wash my bridge out. And the fellow said, what makes you so sure? He said, I know it went into that bridge. And you know something, when that flood came down there with ruling people and houses and animals and freight cars in front of it down that valley, hit that fellow's bridge, that bridge. Buckled, and it bent, and it bowed, and it stayed. Stopped right there. All that debris just piled up behind it. And after that terrible disaster was over, and everybody was picking up remains and looking for relatives and digging up things and trying to recover stuff out of the mud and the silt, somebody said to that engineer, Why did you know your bridge would hold? And he said, When I built that bridge, he said, We dug back a mile in the both sides of the mountains on both sides to put those steel cables in there. That thing was anchored a mile deep on both sides. And I'll tell you something. When you trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior, you got a rock and an anchor that's anchored, brother. And when the flood comes, that bridge is holding. That's holding. And he said, I am the way and the wash out there. You got it made. You know what your trouble is? You need to be convinced of that. You need to be so convinced of that that when you go back from here, you'll sail into them and tell them what Christ means to you, what your beliefs mean to you, what the book says about it, and get on the ball for Christ. You need to be saved from public opinion. These fellows talk about being revolutionaries. They're not revolutionaries. They say, well, we don't care what folks think. Yeah, but you don't care what the Bible says or what God thinks. You're not just saved from public opinion. Uh, you're, you're saved from the truth. And you're sold out to the devil. You know, it's one thing to be saved in public opinion and take the devil's side, and it's another thing to be saved in public opinion and take the Lord's side. I have kids in this country. I don't care what Mama says, what Daddy says, what the preacher says. All they care about is what the devil says. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about being saved and liberated from public opinion in taking your stand for Jesus Christ. Does the old fear gnaw you still when you get up to witness for him? Does it ever get a hold of you and seize you by the throat? It does me once in a while. I must confess, things like this don't bother me. I mean, if I had to speak to four or five thousand people, nothing to that. If I had to go up before the Congress tonight and talk to the Senate and represent the United Nations, I could do it without uh, missing any sleep. But just, you know, talking with somebody on the street, you know, an individual, sometimes it gets me kind of nervous, really. 
Let it go. And you know what you know what I learned? I learned that you've got to get to the place where you can't give a flip what people think about you when it comes to obeying God. I'm a revolutionary. I really, I really am. If you knew me, you know I'm telling you the truth. I'm a Christian anarchist, brother. I believe the answer is not integration, and the answer is not segregation. The answer is disintegration. I believe like the Germans say, brother, in case of rain, the war will be held in the auditorium. I believe that. You know, years ago in this country, there was a fellow who had a great minister. I don't know whether he's still alive or not. He might be. But he had a great ministry with young people. His name was Percy Crawford. And I bet you don't know the history of the man that led him to Christ. The man that led him to Christ was a man named William Nichols. And old William Nicholson was an Irishman and was 15 years old. He ran away from home, lied about his age, got in the Navy. He got to get killed in a, in a, uh, in a wreck in a storm off Cape, uh, Cape Horn. When he got out of there and got out of the Navy, he went to South Africa. He worked on the railroads in South Africa. A little boy was a rough, tough, mean, godless rascal. Had a mother praying for him all the time he was gone. And one day when he was about 26 out there in South Africa eating breakfast, he bowed his head over the, the, the plate there to say grace like his mom had taught him. And he said the words came to him, It's now or never. That's all he heard. It's now or never. When he bowed his head, he trusted Christ. The guy went back to Ireland and told his mama, and she had a fit over it and didn't hardly believe him. When she finally believed him, she got shot and danced around the house like had a heart attack. And that old boy came over the States and came over here and joined a church and got teaching the Sunday school. And he said this. He said, I was saved. And he said, I knew I was saved. But he said, I wasn't happy. He said, prayer wasn't real to me. And the Bible wasn't real to me. And he said, I had a kind of a feeling all my life. My life was kind of a phony. But he said, I knew I was saved. But he said, right down deep, he said, I had a gnawing fear of testifying for Christ. And he said, I just kind of slip and get around it every time I had a chance. And finally, through the help of a man named Stuart Holden and Andrew Murray, that old boy got his eyes open. He saw something. He saw he was never going to mount the hill of beans for God unless he got rid of that fear of man. So he determined to do something about it. And he went down the Salvation Army and said, you people preach on the street? They said, yes. He said, well, I'd like, like to go with you today. And his friends found out about it. They were waiting for him down the street. And that old boy, Nicholson, came down that day to preach with those people. And that day, there were four people in the parade. Two of them were girls. And one was a half-wit named Daff Jimmy, which means deaf and dumb, practically. Daff Jimmy. And they gave him the flag to carry, Nicholson. And the flag had a big red, letter, red letters and white yarn, and it said... Saved from public opinion. And he said, with a hand of that flag to him, Nicholson told the Lord, Lord, I'll go to Alaska, I'll go to Timbuktu, I'll do anything you want me to, but please don't ask me to do this. And the Lord said, do it. So he walked down the street with that thing, hardly even dare look, just suffocating, and got down there and dashed Jimmy, preached some sermon, and stuttered all through the thing. And his friends up there in the corner began to laugh at him. A bunch of cats got around there, began to point the fingers and make fun of him. And they were preparing. Nicholson felt like he was coming apart. And while they were praying, the little girl, one of those little girls passed the tambourine around, took about 65 cents, came back and gave it to Daph Jimmy, and Jimmy knocked the bunny out and handed the tambourine back to Nicholson and said, All right, he said, you lead, lead the parade back to the house. And... Nichols said, I don't know what happened to me, but he said, I made it my mind I wasn't a little old girl outdo me. And if she could handle that tambourine, I could do it. He picked up that tambourine and got that flag and went back down that street banging that tambourine, that flag. And he said, I don't know what happened to me. He said, I don't know whether I was in the body or out of the body. I cannot tell. But he said, I know one thing. He said, that day I lost my reputation and I lost my fear of man and I've never worried about it since. I said, oh boy, that person to Crawford to Christ in 1923. Now, if you want God to use you, get rid of it. Get rid of it. Fear God. Let the rest take care of itself. All right, let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, we ask the Holy Spirit tonight to deal with these young people. Some of them come out of pretty wild, woolly places. Some of them come from good fundamental churches, Lord, and they're 
Christ was right tonight as they can get with thee. Others had a time, oh Lord, they've been stumbling and falling all year. We pray this week they'll get in the mountaintop and see the vision. Hear the hearts of New Jerusalem. Smell the sense, the blossom, the tree of life. Never be the same again. Father, we ask you to save any young person in this auditorium tonight who's never been born again. May they get over their fear of man. May they get over the fear of that aisle, the fear of the invitation, the fear of what people are going to say, what people are going to think. May they take their stand publicly and boldly and openly for Jesus Christ. I head bowed, please, and eyes closed in prayer. I'd like to have our organist play something for us here while we remain a few minutes in prayer. I don't know tonight whether I'm going to give a public invitation or not. It's the first night of camp. You little time to think about these things, a little time for the Holy Spirit to do His work. A lot of musicians are playing something, heads are bowed and eyes are closed. How many of you kids raise your hand and say, Preacher, I know I'm saved, I know I'm born again, but I must confess, just a minute, hold it just a minute, but I must confess the thought of witnessing and testifying for Christ makes me nervous. I think I'm somewhat of a coward. And I've been afraid to witness for Jesus Christ, even though I am saved. By the grace of God, by the grace of God, from tonight on, I'm going to be a better witness. Would you raise your hand? Would you hold your hands up? All right, thank you. Put them down. Now, please pray just a few minutes. And while you're praying, those of you who raised your hands, ask God to give you something this week that will make you different, give you some backbone, give you some courage. How many of you raise your hand here tonight and say, Brother Ruffman, I'm saved, and I know I'm saved. I know I've been born again. I'm absolutely sure of it. But I have never actually myself led anybody to Jesus Christ. Even though I'm saved, I can't think of any person that I myself have led to Christ. Would you raise your hand? Would you hold your hand up? Be honest about it. Raise them up. All right, thank you. Put them down. Maybe about half the people here tonight. You pray a while. Ask the Lord to make a soul in out of you. Give you some iron. Give you some grit. Give you what you need. One more invitation. How many here tonight raise your hand and say, Preacher, as far as I know, I've never been saved. As far as I know, I never have really, truly received Jesus Christ, my Savior, never confessed Him before men. Pray for me that I might have the courage to trust Christ and confess Him openly. Would you raise your hands? Would you hold them up? Up high. Thank you there. Thank you there. You're over there. All right. Just stepping right back down. Nobody else? You raise your hand and say, I'm not a Christian. I've never been saved. Pray for me. I need the courage to trust Christ. Confess him before men. It'll take courage. The devil will bring every pressure to bear upon you he can to keep you from Jesus Christ. Would you raise a hand? Somebody else. Somebody else. Not a child of God, not saved. All right, thank you, young lady, I see it. Just up and right back down. And we're in the building. We'll tire in just a few minutes. Would you raise a hand? I'm not saved. I never have really and truly received the Lord Jesus, confessed him before man. Pray for me. It'll take prayer. As if it didn't take prayer, you'd have done it for now. Something got a hold of you, something kept you back. Some of you kids have heard the gospel three, four, five, six times already. Some got you by the throat. You need prayer. Would you raise the hand? Ask these other young people to intercede for you. Take the throne of grace. Give you the strength you need. Some of you are weak and you're weak from sin. Would you raise the hand? Somebody else, quickly. We're going to close. Somebody else raise the hand? Not saved? Never have received Christ my Savior. Pray for me. All right, Father, that's the invitation. We pray for the souls, these that raise their hands. We pray you'll give them the strength they need in this hour to open their hearts to Jesus Christ, submit their will to Him, and by an act of faith, receive Him as a personal Savior, pass from death to life, May they see their blood-stained cross and appropriate that blood for their sins. May they not be ashamed of the old rugged cross. They confess Christ openly before man, knowing the fear of man, bringeth a snare, but whoso trusteth in the Lord shall be safe. 
We ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Let's stand. Let's stand now. We're only going to sing about three or four stanzas tonight before we're dismissed. But I, I feel like I should give you an opportunity to receive Christ. Some of you raised a hand tonight and said you weren't saved. Right, now here's the test. Here's the test. Christ said, Fear him that is able to store both body and soul in hell. Yea, I say unto you, Fear him. Never mind man, but fear of man bringeth a snare. Let's sing, Just as I am. Just as I am. Just as I am, I will be seen. Well, welcome, God, and let me be. Because I promise, I believe, oh, well, I'll go. I'd like to have us for a last stand to sing, Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way, thou art the potter, I am the clay. And let me say this tonight, if you, maybe you have received Jesus Christ before you came to camp, but you have never confessed him openly, publicly, before an assembly of Christians, let me extend the invitation to you. If you will come and receive the Lord as your Savior tonight, come. If you have received him, but you have not yet received him.